All right. So I always like to talk a little bit about where do these things come from? And I try to make any of my what I would call keynote style. I'm not sure what that means, but ho hopefully it differentiates it from here's a you know talk about my pretty pictures, which I'm not. So that's not something I like to personally do or it's not technique necessarily, although we will touch on technique. I call these more motivational, inspiration type of lectures. So where do they come from? Generally, they come from my experiences and either two things. One, as a photographer myself and my personal experiences, and then also observing for the last, well, since 2007, so hundreds of workshops later, observing other people's process and how they arrive at their own way of engaging with this thing that we all love to do called photography. So it's important then to understand that, oops, why is that not going forward here? Obviously, I mean, there we go. So we all know that the most important about part of photography is the camera. You know, if you have a micro four thirds, that's a great little camera. I'm a Fuji shooter. And, you know, some people say, John, in order to make even better images, you should really get a Sony because Sony's full frame. And you all know that full frame actually makes better photographs than a micro four thirds and, and, and a, you know, APS-C crop sensor. And then somebody said to me, but if you really, really want to make good pictures, John, you got to get a little red dot on your camera because then people will know clearly that you are a professional. I mean, just the virtue of the red dot alone makes you good. Everything, every shutter press is going to be perfect. But then Tony Sweet, who's a Nikon legend behind the lens, you guys all know him. He said, but John, Red dot, schmed dot, it doesn't matter. Seriously, look at Canon. I mean, Nikon. Nikon's got like a whole plethora to, I mean, you just put any one of those lenses on and you're a good photographer. And then, of course, my buddy Cole Thompson, who's a Canon shooter, says, Nikon's got nothing on Canon. Canon's got the gear to assure that you, too, can make fabulous pictures just like Art Wolf. Well, you know, Reality, right, Diane, is we know that that's just not true. It's, it really isn't about the gear. Yes, gear is important. It's fun to have new gear. We, we all enjoy that, right? But it's not about the gear. It, come on, it's nice when the slides actually advance when you want them to. Because we all know that cameras don't make or create images. They're, they're just a mechanical device. One lets, you know, the, it lets len the lens lets light in and, and hits the sensor. Cameras don't make or create images. You do. You, you're responsible for every square millimeter of the frame that you're composing. That's your job. A camera knows nothing mm -hmm. about that. And we do that by, in my mind, mastering your craft. And... Mm -hmm. Whoops. But the images that you make that make your heart sing, those come by embracing your vision. So that's what I'd like to talk about tonight is that what I've kind of discovered that for most people, we need to learn the craft side. And so we'll spend a little time talking about, so what is craft? What am I talking about? Uh, but then also talk about vision and how does vision play into this and how do we kind of put those two things together. So Ansel said, in, in case you don't believe me, uh, Ansel said the way to art is through craft, not around it. So even Ansel understood how important craft was in the equation and he was a master, right? Created the zone system and he was a, a master technician. So then let's kind of explore them. What does it mean then to master your craft? Well, first and foremost, I played one of my ukuleles there quickly. I like to make analogies to, to music because I find music and photography very much the same. So when I, and I play a number of instruments, none of them really, really well, that's my problem. I play a lot of them pretty good, but none great. <laughs> I played a tuba in a Dixieland band, a trumpet, a baritone horn in high school, um, trumpet for a long time. And then I taught myself guitars and ukuleles. And, and, you know, those are the ones that I've actually been able to play. But you have to know your gear. You need to understand your gear inside out and backwards so that you're expressing from here. 
That's the switch to me that needs to happen. That's what's happened to me is I finally understood how important my heart was in this whole process of making good photographs. It was way more important than I originally thought. So it's important to know our gear so well that it gets out of the way of the process. That's what I'm getting to. So that, again, we're talking about a craft in the beginning here, so that we can instinctively respond to what's calling us. Because the reality that I've learned, and this is abundantly true to me, is we don't take photographs. We don't make photographs. We receive photographs. And it's a paradigm shift that I wish more and more people would believe is true because that's what's happening. We are taken by something. We go, wow. We go, oh. we go, oh my. Whatever your response is, that's what's happening. You are being taken. And then it is your responsibility to respond. And that's where craft does matter because if I understand that if I move my camera, in this case, over a fifth of a second, at put Steptoe-Butte in the Palouse, I might get something that's more painterly. Or if I learn how to do multiple exposures and move my camera in little increments over 10 times or eight times or however many I want to, I can create a different look so that when I find a scene like this, that's quite ordinary, I can maybe think about turning it into something that's quite extraordinary and maybe more representative of the artistic feeling that was invoked in me because of how I was taken. So what are some of the other things in the craft part of the equation? Well, we need to understand depth of field so that when we see these beautiful little spring flowers, I know that at f2.8, there's a good chance all that depth of, uh, I'm sorry, all that background is going to go out of focus. So I need to know that. And I need to understand that if, if I'm going to do that, I'm going to have so little depth of field, I better make the back of my camera parallel with that flower so that those will be as sharp as possible. But it's not quite that simple. I mean, if you're at Longwood Gardens, they don't like it when you jump in to the lily ponds, they get mad. <laughs> and so I've learned not to do that. I don't want to get kicked out. So here I am, I've got a reasonably long lens to you know, 70 to 200 trying to fill the frame. And F5, 6, I get one right answer. And that right answer says that the foreground is pretty much in sharp, but the background's not. That's one right answer. The next right answer is to say, let's try F13 of the same composition. How does that affect how I feel? And then the next right answer is to try to go to F22 and use that part of the triad of, of um, depth of field to help me the best I can to get it all sharp. I don't, what I, if you take something, the nuggets away, one of the key nuggets for me in my photography is not to be worried about which is the right one. They're all right answers. They're all answers that are coming up in me at the moment in the, I'm, I'm in that zone of creativity. And I'm going to create all of those. And I'll decide later whether which one feels right for that moment in time. Just understand that your job is to engage in the craft, just like here. Okay, I remembered somebody said depth of field is F22, I'll get everything sharp. And they go take a picture and they don't review it, or they trip the shutter, I should say, and, and they review it, and don't review it rather. And then they get home and they go, oh my gosh, that's not at all what I saw in you know here, right? And if they had known to, to just stop for a second and say, but wait a minute, you know, am I, is it okay to make a little sacrifice and not have everything sharp, but have something sharp enough, but get that background out of focus? Dramatically different photographs, dramatically different. And all that changed was my f-stop, my aperture. That's it. How about color versus black and white? They evoke two very different feelings. So my, re my feeling about black and white, and I adore black and white, is that we use it with care, that we, again, we, we make our decision here, not necessarily here. We don't just hit a button and say, I wonder what, although that's okay. And especially in the learning process, we hit a button and we learn, oh, 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 right. Those are good moments. But we get to a place where we can actually be in the field and realize black and white is what I want because I want to show the graphic bones of my image. And that's what was appealing to me. 
We need to understand even simple things like a polarizer and some people don't, right? And so we show this and we say, you know what, John, why did you even show that? It's a horrible photograph. Well, because I wanna show you that I'm smart enough to use a polarizer. And when I polarized it, I got a completely different answer than I did without a polarizer. It made it work. Whereas before without it, it didn't. And I just wanna remind you that a polarizer is not an on off switch. It doesn't mean you need to go all the way, especially with those skies. We tend to go and make it super blue and those white puppy clouds. You might consider not doing 100%. You might back off to half or three quarters or a quarter or like this, no polarizer to some polarization. And we can still see some of those dark shadows to full polarization. We get rid of all of those shadows again. There's no right answer here. There's just a bunch of right answers, right? Different feelings are evoked for every one of those. We might wanna consider texture overlays and learn about the craft of doing that so that when we see an image like we did on this one, on this one, what I did is something I don't always do. I inverted it to a negative and then I started putting some textures in with it and come up with something else a little more creative and maybe more artistic. So knowledge of texture would fall into craft so that we get a, I no longer worry about ball blue sky days because it just gives me a canvas to do something else with and play. I love my friend, Jack Davis, who talks about this idea of a sense of play as an adult, we need to be more like children with our photography and have a sense of play and, and treat it like it's a box of, remember when you got a box of 64 brand new crayons? <laughs> was that not the coolest thing ever, Jim? I mean, seriously, it was so cool. They were all sharp, you know, the little sharpener on the side, you know, and we're all old enough to remember. And we partied. It was a party. That's where I want you to be when you're, ah, oh, it's a ball blue sky day. No, 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 no. It's a ball blue sky day. This is awesome. I'm going to make pictures like this. Very different. We can do diffuse glow. And if we know what the craft part of that is, we can have that in our quiver, if you will, to pull out the arrow of diffused glow or like try to get the Orton look that we did with film. So here's my sharp image. Here's my soft image made it grow bigger. So I'm using like a 70 to 200 at 200, focusing towards me so it grows bigger. And then I put those two together and I get something that looks like the old Orton effect. That's a craft idea. Shutter speed and understanding shutter speed versus the f-stop that we talked about briefly. If you look at the very top, there's a stick up there and it's not gonna move. I'm on a tripod and all I'm gonna do is go from a quarter of a second to 125th of a second. Two different answers, right? But you need to know that. You need to understand in advance and try all of them. So the beauty of digital is, you know, back in film when I, this one was shot, you know, I, I might do two or three. <laughs> you know, now I do about 60 because <laughs> they're so addictive. I mean, you just can't stop. And I'm going through all of my F-stops, two, eight, you know, four, five, six, I'm doing them all. And just to see what I'm going to get. So when we're talking about craft and we go to Molokai to do the contemplative photography retreat that I do with a wonderful Zen priest, Flint Sparks, and, and then DeWitt Jones and Ricky Cook, two great National Geographic guys are there with us as well. And we, and we do this in the wintertime when hopefully the waves are big, that's when they happen. And we're on a beach there that's at an angle that allows you to shoot down through the tunnels of these waves like this. Well, shoot, it's complicated, folks, and we spend an hour before we get in the Jeeps to head down to the beach, talking about you're gonna put your camera in manual mode, you're gonna set it at F8, two thousands of a second, you're gonna go auto ISO so that you have floating ISO, it's basically ISO priority is what you're doing so that you're not worrying about depth of field, you're not worrying about shutter speed, you lock those in. And then you're gonna go continuous high because waves move really fast. And you want to capture that whole series of the wave going down. And you might want to wide track the wave and use AFC. It goes on and on, right? So those are very definite craft parts of the equation. Without all that knowledge, it's going to hard, be hard to get your heart involved. But once we get people set up with their cameras so that all they got to do is take those first few images and then change their compensation a little bit because it might be too bright. And then once they lock that in, boy, they just fire away and they're engaging with being taken like you read about. It's a blast. How about a lens, baby? 
it's a creative tool. It might fit into that category, but to me, it's also craft-based because what I love about a lens, baby, is it forces me to determine where I want the viewer to look in my image. I want you to look at the sharp part of that image and then go kind of the soft spots next, right? And so hopefully you go to the, the, uh, the cab driver and then everything else is a supportive cast around that. Um, they also have soft focus lenses or velvet lenses. This is a velvet 56. Understanding light. Obviously that's really important. That's really what we are. We're painters of light as photographers. So knowing that it pays to be patient, especially as a landscape photographer, boy, I got dust spots on there. Isn't that funny? You don't notice them right away and then all of a sudden they, they glare out at you. Um, but waiting, I mean, it's, that tree just doesn't have any light. But if I just wait a little while for a cloud to move, it's a completely different photograph because now I have some light and some shadow and light and puffy clouds and contrast and all those good things. So reading the light, like this light of, of that early morning before the sun's coming up, I've got color out on the horizon for the sunrise happening and I'm drawn like a magnet to this lighthouse. But I'm not moving anywhere. I know that it's going to change. It's going to go from that really soft light and that blue light to maybe a little warmer. And I've got the moon behind it. And then that first, I mean, it hasn't even fully broke over the horizon out on the, on the ocean at this point. And I've got warm light. So I've gone in, you know, in minutes, 10 minutes, I've gone from this beautiful, cool light to this in between to this beautiful, warm light. And that's because I know what's going to happen and I understand the quality of light and you should too. So how does focal length play in this whole uh, conversation about craft? Well, it, it does affect our depth of field, right? So the wider the angle of view of a lens, the more inherent depth of field we have. As we go more telephoto, the more we reach out, the less depth of field we have. So here I am uh, in the y y Yellowstone and I'm, I'm on a boardwalk. They don't allow you to go beyond that point. So I'm reached out at 300 millimeters. Well, what f-stop do I need to be at? Can I be at f8? Should I be at f16? So those are the craft questions. And then I turn around and start walking back and you know, 50 yards from where I was, I'm looking at a completely different scene. And I accidentally shot this at f4, but I was at 10 millimeters on my Fuji, you know, which is equivalent of 15. And thankfully it was all sharp enough because Depth of field on a wide angle lens is so much better. I should have been at F8, F11, something like that. So what I'm actually saying is we need to understand our craft so well that we're freed from its constraints and liberated to pursue our vision. All those craft things are so important to know them so well that we're liberated from them, right? That we're not having to consult the manual every time we go out to photograph. We're not having to think about, what did John say about doing swipes? Was it a fifth of a second? No, we, we've kind of got that dialed in. And so when the moment happens, we can turn from photographing the Palouse landscape to, oh my gosh, there's a gal doing self-portraits and start focusing on having a party over here with different settings right away. Very different than landscape settings because she's moving her dress and doing all these neat things. Great, so, but what about this vision thing you speak of, oh wise one? <laughs> what the heck is it? And that's a really good question because I think it's a, it's a discussion that's worthy to have amongst yourself as a club. I'm fortunate enough to, know, to call, call Cole Thompson a dear friend at this point. And we chat all the time as we're doing our pre-tour scouting. That's all we're talking about is vision. And that's all that Cole can think about is vision. That's his whole thing. And it's really had a major impact on me. So he and I come up with a very similar uh, a definition, I knew I could get it to come out there, a definition for, for vision. It's your view of the world based on your life experiences. So vision in the context of photography and the discussion I'd like to have tonight has to do with you as a human being and all of your life experiences, whether it be political, religious, educational, um, financial, 
you know, if, whether you came from poverty, from wealth, from no religion to religion, to from Buddhism to Christianity, to whatever makes you who you are. And that is where your vision is born from. I, it's, we're not talking style here. We're not saying, hey, I want to create a style. I'm asking you to think maybe for the first time in your life, and it, and it, and it takes time. This time. You don't sit down and go, I know what my vision is. It, you got to think about it. And what is my vision of life? How do I experience life based on who I am as a human? And I, my invitation tonight is that you will then maybe start to think more deeply about that and let that color or let that vision become part of your work. So vision is something that develops over time. It's, you can't force it. And it's constantly changing. Why? Because with vision, if I learn about something that's added to my vision, if I read a book that's added to my vision, if I see a movie that's incredibly moving, my vision may have just changed because of all those things. And it may, well, for instance, there's a time when you would, I grew up with horses that we boarded horses in our barn. Um, and I rode horses a little bit. I'm you know, not a huge horse fan, but it was, I, you know, cleaned the stalls for 50 cents a month or something, you know, back in those days. And so the point being, but I never would have thought photographing horses would have been, the, I, I do trees, you know, I do landscapes. I had a blast. My vision changed, right, about that whole experience of being at the hideout. So we each have our own unique vision. There's no right or wrong with regard to vision. There's just vision, right? And getting in touch with what is making that vision up. So I would say this, I, I would say that what, to maybe help you with the vision idea, that what you're doing is you're bringing with you your vision when you make your photographs. So meaning all of your fears, your passions, your likes, your biases, your dislikes, the daily grind, the failed marriage, the recent death in the family, the lousy day at work, the good day at work, the new marriage, the new boyfriend, the new girlfriend, on and on and on. That's what we're talking about. And whether you want to consciously accept it as truth or not, I'm just here to tell you, it affects your photography period. There's no getting around it. And if you talk to the DeWitt Jones and the Ricky Cooks and the Art Wolfs, they will all totally agree with that 100%. That you're so, let's go back to music. Stevie Ray Vaughan, I mean, one of the greatest blues players ever. I adore Stevie Ray's stuff. You can feel him slathered all over his strings. That's vision coming out on his strings, in, in my opinion. So to be able to connect with our vision, I would suggest that we need to learn to see more deeply and receive more deeply as I start thinking more and more about receiving rather than uh, being, you know, being taken. So how are we taken more deeply? How do we see more deeply? Well, I'm going to turn to someone who is far more eloquent than I, and that's my friend Freeman Patterson who, if you don't have his, any of his books, you need to run and buy all of them. Uh, Freeman is a genius, not only as a photographer, and he's won the Order of Canada for his photography, but he's probably an even better writer, a very deep thinker about photography and life. And so he puts it so succinctly here. He says, seeing in the finest and broadest sense means using your senses. And I would add to that all of them your intellect and your emotions. It means encountering your subject matter with your whole being. It means looking beyond the labels of things and discovering the remarkable world around you. He goes on to say, the person who sees is involved. The person who looks, casually looks is not. So the person who sees is involved in that. Their whole being is involved in that moment. Whereas if you're just casually glancing around, you're not. Good seeing does not ensure good photographs. But good photographic expression, interesting choice of words here, good photographic expression is impossible without it. 
those are some powerful words to be thinking about as you think about going from you know snapshot type shooting to images with maybe a little bit deeper meaning. But are there some barriers? Are there things that can kind of get in the way? Absolutely. How about this preoccupation with self? Is probably the, the greatest barrier. You know, I can't do that. I don't know. I, you know, it didn't work last time I did that. Right? It, so, so self absorbed with all of what you can and can't do and what you do and don't bring, you know, that can really get in the way of being able to just relax and let go and be aware and present to that moment. Kind of like this, letting so so letting go of the self then becomes an essential precondition for real seeing. So letting go of all of those, and we'll talk about this in a second, labels, all of those things that that self-talk and the doubt and the fears and certainty and all that stuff. We've got to get let go of all those self things that get in the way. How about this one? Man, can that get in the way? I mean, how often are we sitting there and I'm guilty? I mean, I love seeing everybody else's image. You know, I'm I'm flipping through Instagram, 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 getting completely, you know, scared because I don't think I want to put an image up because all these look way better than my image. You know, all that that goes back to that letting go, right? That occupation preoccupation with self, but the mass stimuli around us. How how do we quiet ourselves enough so that we can actually see? But we can't do it by being bombarded all the time. So maybe one of my favorites that Freeman has taught me about is to let go of labels. Freeman sees things as circles or squares or rectangles. He sees them as graphic shapes, a face as an oval, a pine tree as a triangle, an ocean scene is simply two rectangles, things like that. And so when he's building his images, he's building them based on graphic design. Right? So he's connecting with, he's seeing deeply, but then when he starts to get into the process of organizing the frame to make it be something that represents what he was called to, to photograph, now he starts to employ things where he's not saying, oh, that's good light, bad light. You'll never hear Freeman say that. Matter of fact, I said it and I got in trouble <laughs> when I was with him in South Africa. He said, John, I've never thought about light as good or bad. And he was dead serious. He says, it's such a dangerous place to be. It's just light. Now, I, I agree. And he would agree that, you know, that first hour, the last hour that we call gold light certainly gives you images that you feel a certain feeling about. But sometimes you need midday light to get another image that has shadows just the way you want them to be. I think about being in the slot canyons. You got to have the sun straight up overhead so that it reflects into the canyons, right? So this idea of locking into that's the right time to photograph, not right time. That's pretty. That's ugly. That's right. That's wrong. All of those labels that we put on things. And if you don't think Freeman is good enough, let's go to Monet. In order to see, we must forget the name of the thing we're looking at. Eh, pretty good reference. Not bad. Monet. So I would say this. I think it's what I'm asking you to do is really have a vision for your life, not your images. Your images will be a byproduct of that vision for your life. And, and think about that. And so Jay Mizell, you know, when it was asked, how do I make more interesting images? He quickly replied and said, become a more interesting person as only Jay Mizell could. He was kind of, he is rather kind of in your face, New Yorker, right? But he's right. You know, go to, Go to the museums, read more books, practice. All those things we talk about are going to make you a more interesting human. Thus, your images are going to become more interesting. And then, thus, your images should be an extension of your vision. Thoreau says it's not what you look at that matters. It's what you see. I think I might think about, I'm thinking about this right on the spot. I'm, the more I think about this, yeah, it's not what you look at that matters. It's what you're receiving. I understand it's probably the same thing in the semantics, but I can't drill that home enough. It's what you see. It's what you're being taken by 
is so important to me as I photograph. I'm, I'm so less, much more or less prone to photograph now until I have that moment, until I really am going, wow. And then I slow down and I say, what did I just say wow about? Was it texture? Was it color? Was it the still water? Was it the reflection? And now I'm going to photograph it. So with all of this, you have a great group, as I was commenting before. You have incredibly good photographers in your group, highly skilled. So who do you listen to with this whole craft and vision discussion? Do you listen to a masters of fine art mentor that you have? Do you listen to the Instagram 500 pics Facebook crowd? Are they who you go to to get your feedback? I don't know. Let's explore a little bit. Oh, that's right. Friends and family too. Do friends and family, your friends at your club, family that you, you want to show your images to, how do they play into it? So let's start with, and I have permission from Cole to show you these because I think there's no better example. Okay, so an MFA, you know, Master of Fine Art Mentor or a judge at a jury show. We're going to use them as our sounding board and what they say to be true. And how might that impact our work? Well, Cole Thompson, one of his best-selling images ever is the Angel Gabriel. Couple side notes here. This image is not sharp because it's a 30 second exposure. He asked Gabriel, and that was his name, to stand still because he wanted to let all those other people who were moving become ghosts or disappear over 30 seconds. But nobody can stand still holding their Bible for 30 seconds and be still. I find that fascinating that this is still his best-selling image. It's not sharp in any way, shape or form, right? But more importantly, he took this image. It was his first really well thought out image from vision standpoint. He knew exactly how he wanted this moment to happen. And, and so he quickly shared it with his MFA mentor friend. And in about a minute and a half, received back a note from her that said, Cole, how many times have I talked to you about not centering your images? And so he says, okay, I'll try it in a square and I'll put Gabriel way off to the left and to the right. It, it made him, you know, sick. <laughs> and so he says, I know, I'll just make it a regular two by three, but I'll push him off to the left. And he finally said, you know what, mentor, you're wrong. This image needs to be like this. This is the way I saw it in my mind. This is the way it feels right to me. And I don't know about you, but this is the only way this image can work. And, and Angel Gabriel's dead center bullseye, arguably, I might say that he's bottom center because he's all connected. If it was just his face and only his face, it would be dead center bullseye, I guess. But the cautionary tale here is if he had let the MFA fine art mentor who is educated and maybe smarter than him about this thing called photography and what makes good art and bad art, he would never have had the best-selling image he's ever had. So I'm all for mentors. I am a mentor to 10 people this last year. But when I do the mentorship that I've done with these people, I tell them up front, my job is to learn what your vision is so much that I can help you achieve it. That's what I'm doing. I'm not telling them what their images should and shouldn't should look like. I'm helping them to get to that goal of what they, they want their images to look like. That's what matters. How about this whole thing of chasing likes on Facebook, on 500 pics or wherever you are. Now 500 PX is not near as popular as it used to be. But this, this example, even though it was a little older, I think still tells the story I want to tell. Back when I was playing with this, you know, you would go to the front page and you just feel just overwhelmed with the incredible greatness of the images that are the, you know, editor's choices and the top of the heap, 99 points and all that stuff. And that was your goal was to make it to the first three pages of 500 picks. 
So my buddy, uh, oh, my buddy Donnie Folks, just excuse me just for a minute here. My buddy Donnie Folks saw that I was enjoying 500 picks back in the day. This is probably 10 years ago. And he says, you know, I think I'm going to try it. I said, yeah, you should, Donnie. It's really fun. And so Donnie does this. He puts this picture up. And look at this. Look at me. He says, people think I'm great. There's 197 people. 93 people has made it a favorite. It tells me I'm popular. At the bottom right there, it says popular with a star next to it. So he didn't even have to guess. It tells you he's popular. 98.5 is the highest pulse he's had, which is really good. And so I said, Donnie, it's fun, isn't it? He's, oh, great. I said, you know, Donnie, what are you going to post next? Well, I'm going to put, you know, I'm going to go to the, 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 the tree, you know, Botany Bay, right? I think that's Botany Bay. And so, you know, he puts that, oh my gosh, John, look at this, another 98.4. I'm still popular. Even more people are making it a favorite. And then I say to Donnie, Donnie, how come you're not posting the stuff you always send to me that you love that's really out of the box? You know, those grungy texture things you send me that you love them. What's up? He said, well, they're probably not going to do well. I said, well, why don't you find out? And so he puts up one that I invited him to put up and I knew it was going to happen. I mean, nobody cared. Eight people liked it. Me, his mother, his sister, you know, I mean, I knew that was going to happen because people just don't resonate with this. But my point to Donnie was, I want you to share what's making your heart sing, Donnie. And so the next question I asked him was, what are you going to do? Are you going to continue to post this and this? Because you know it's going to get a good score? Or are you going to try to change the masses mind and post this and let them see who you are as an artist? Let them feel what you feel about your art. You know, I did it. Look, I, I was popular, not as good as Donnie, but I had a lot more views, you know, and then I did this. I said, Donnie, I'll do the same thing. I'll put up a pretty ordinary image. You know, it tanked. I didn't even become popular. Did I throw the image away? No, I love this image. I love this image. I would frame it and put it in my house. I'm not going to let the 500 pics Instagram or Facebook crowd tell me what my images should or shouldn't be. I'm going to make that decision. How about your friends at the club and family? I'll talk about my family <laughs> because I love them to death, except when it comes to my photography. Okay, so I bring, you know, go to Iceland, come home, and my vision is screaming at me making these images. I can't wait to get home and make this super high key horse with this dark background. I show it to my wife. Seriously, honey? That, that's your first picture from Iceland. Isn't it like colorful there? Yes. Like green? Yes. Like aren't there waterfall? Yes. And this is what you're excited about. This is the first. Okay, obviously she didn't like it. I went to the Palouse. Of course, I've been going there for a million years. I've done what, 17 workshops there now. But this year I was like out of the box, baby. I'm shooting graphic designs. I'm in a black and white state of mind. I come home and I show this one. Same thing. Green rolling hills. I love your rolling hills. This doesn't work. I wouldn't show that to anybody. That was the response I got. I went to Africa, South Africa, to be with Freeman. But we got to go to an old junkyard over there. And I found this old Chevy truck. And I shot it with film with my Hasselblad x pan First image I got done. <laughs> my wife says, again, you went to South Africa and you took a picture of a car that you could find like down the street. <laughs> yeah, it's great. You can't find patina like this in our country, honey. There's only patina like this in South Africa. She just didn't get it. Now my mother comes into play. I post this on Facebook and I'm just laughing my butt off because I love this photograph. I think it's hysterically funny. Right, it's out in Death Valley, and I actually spent time going to lift the seat of that outhouse up just because I thought it would add to the picture. Probably should have had Chuck Kimberly in there sitting down, you know, on the toilet, would have made it even funnier. But my mother wrote to me, you know, at this point, she was probably 90, right? Not 98. And she says, Honey, I am so embarrassed that you would even put a picture like that up on Facebook. <laughs> 
I said, Mom, it's funny. Come on, it's funny. So, so who do you listen to? You know, do you listen to that MFA fine art mentor? Do you listen to the 500 pics, the, the, you know, the Instagram crowd, your family and friends? No, <laughs> absolutely no. <laughs> you listen to you. You, Cole is at the point where he will just never give feedback on an image. Just won't do it because he's, he, he's, so, he's so worried about coloring somebody else's effort and their vision with his. And he's like, I have no right to do that because I don't know what their vision is. And that's, again, back to my mentorship stuff. I want to learn as best I can about what their vision is and then help them achieve that. And so that's the type of mentor I would encourage you to find in, in the club is somebody who is going to honor your vision and help you achieve that. So no, I want you to trust you. I want you to really start to trust that you know what you're doing, that you can photograph these up close wheels at the Damon Barn, do it in infrared, have that background out of focus and create what I feel is a ridiculously stunning photograph. I love this photograph. I don't care if anybody else doesn't like it. And I'm sure a lot of people don't, but I adore it. And that's all that matters to me. It's icing on the cake if you like it too. To help you along the way, Covey says you have experiences. That's part of vision, right? And talents exclusive to you. I'm asking you to believe that you do, because we all do. Every one of us has our own set of unique talents that are exclusive to you. And I would say based on your life or vision. So what things can get in the way specifically of this vision, maybe a little different than seeing, but they're going to be similar. Lack of confidence, you know, fears, uncertainties, and doubts, expectations, rules, others' opinions, which we've sort of talked about, competition, technique. So I would just remind you to be careful with those pesky little feelings of inadequacy. When others are in that joyful moment of, oh, oh my gosh, I love this. And you're over there doing like I do. Sometimes I'm going, what? <laughs> you know, they're having this moment and I'm like looking around and I'm looking, I don't get it. What the heck are they in love with? You know, that can really affect you as a human. You can be feeling really inadequate at that moment. And I've been there many, many, many times, especially when I was learning. Gosh, why can't I see like Tony Sweetkin when I was taking workshops from him? You know, I see, I see somebody else's images in a club and I'm like, gosh, I, I was right there and I never saw that. Be careful with those. And I would invite you to lovingly push them aside, meet them, and then just let them pass right through. Say, oh, I remember you, dear friend, FUD. <laughs> Fears, uncertainties, and debts. Not today. Not going to happen. I am going to sit here, and I'm going to receive an image, whether it kills me or not. <laughs> you know, And you're not going to get in the way of that happening today. And be careful of those expectations that you have. You know, you're going to go to Cuba with me one day when we can go again, and we're going to pan cars, and, and you're going to do it for an hour, and you're not going to get one image that you like. You know, those expectations can then all of a sudden really frustrate the heck out of you. And I'll be standing right next to you saying, no, no, let's, we just got to try it again. Let me watch what you're doing. And together, we're going to kind of make that happen. Or the ex expectation that you might have, like my buddy Dan used to do all the time. He was my tour partner for 40 tours. And he would go to the smoke and he'd have a shot list. You know, I want to get these 10 shots. When we go to Sparks Lane, I want it to be this. And when we go here, I want to get that. And so, and that's what his expectation was. And so the year before he quit doing tours with me, he said, John, I just want you to know on this trip, I'm not going to in the Smokies. I, I might be in the car a lot. I might be napping a lot. I just, I've, I've shot it all in the Smokies. I've been there, you know, 15 times. There's nothing else to do. If something moves me, I'll get out of the car and get a tripod. These are all my images. I probably should get his. His story might be even richer. But, you know, as we're going through the week, he really didn't get out of the car very much. He, you know, he's getting older. He's now 80. 
So he would have been like 76 and he just was getting tired. And, and so we're going along and he has this image and we both have it because we stumbled upon it at the same time after we kind of finished for the morning. And what happened was that Dan, unlike me, I don't process images when I'm on a workshop. I just like to be involved in the moment of capturing and seeing and being taken. And I just find that other stuff to get in the way of that process. I liked film for that reason. I didn't have to worry about doing anything with my film until I got home. I love that process. But Dan's different. He would download religiously, work on his image, tinker away, tinker away. You know, we would share a room. So I'd be in bed sleeping and he'd be tinkering away, you know. And so I said, Dan, how did you do? And I went over and he says, John, let me show you the 12 that I got this week. The 12 that he got were extraordinary, <laughs> like this one, but he had 11 others that were the best images that he had ever created in the Smokies. Isn't that interesting? So this is the time he went with zero expectations. He went open to be able to receive something. And when he did, he got out of the car and he photographed it. Wasn't forcing a thing. So a month later, we end up on the Palouse together. He says, John, that went pretty well in the Smokies. I'm going to try that again. <laughs> I said, that's a good idea, Dan. And so there we were out photographing and stumbling upon canola and red barns. Are you kidding me? We're having a party. And we went and flew in airplanes and photographed from 2,000 to 3,000 feet and had another party. And we had the tree before the ones, by the way, that tree looks like it's dying because it had no foliage on it this year at all. And so it may well not be there a whole lot longer, which would be amazing because this is kind of the iconic shot in the Palouse. And so guess what happened? At the end of that trip with Dan, a month later, I went over and said, how did you do? And guess what? Same thing. He'd been to the Palouse 20 times. He'd been going way before I met him. And these were this particular set of images that he had were hands down the absolute best that were ever taken from him in the Palouse. Pretty strong testimony to not going anywhere with expectations, but rather being open to being taken. And being open to another right answer is what I would add to that. And what do I mean by that? Dalen says, let's go photograph a picture of me before I move from Philadelphia to California and take my family out there. I'm a Rocky fan. I want to get me down on the, 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 the pier there, the coal, coal pier, and have Philadelphia in the background. And so we nailed it. First shot. I said, let's go home. No, that's not what I said. <laughs> I said, are you kidding me? We're in a place that's rich for another right answer. And another right answer, and another right answer, and another right answer. I mean, you got a willing participant. Are you kidding me? I'm just going to keep making images until he says, I'm done. I need breakfast. And then we walk up front, and what do we see? I see this incredible light, and I say, Dalen, go shadow box in front of that. And so we got you shadow boxing. And then, because I'm a professional photographer, I know the right time to make a vertical is right after you make a horizontal. I mean, that's just absolute professionals only know that. It's a secret that you now know. <laughs> I'm kidding. Okay. I mean, you know, my favorite image of the whole stinking morning was just this him kind of in the background shadow boxing. Never would have happened if I went with the expectation and without looking for another right answer and another right answer and another right answer. So be open to that moment of perception. That's my invitation. You know, to what turns your head. I've been out, we, had, we didn't have great weather on the first of the two Palouse trips I did this year. But the day that they went home, this happened. And I, I don't have the next image, but the next image is an incredible rainbow that happened literally right next to this building. I'm sitting there photographing and there it is. Boop! And I was like, are you kidding me? But this gold light was what caused me to go, I can't go to dinner. <laughs> I mean, this is incredible. And I pulled over and I'm getting soaked on my side of the road. It's torrential rain. And on that side of the road, it's just 
gorgeous sun with stormy clouds behind it. So be open to that moment of perception. And the story that I like to share that really drills this idea of being open to those moments of perception is this one. I went to Yellowstone. I wanted to go to Grand Prismatic Spring. We got there and it was kind of crappy. You know, and we got there a little late. It was better earlier. I said, Dan, the next day, we better go more on time. I really want to get up. Expectation, expectation, expectation. Ying, 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 ying. You know, that, I'm in that. I need this stuff more than you guys do, right? I, that's why I remember I said these things come from my experience. Well, I experience all this stuff all the time. I still do, right? I'm not perfect at it. So there I am going to meet my expectation, meet my expectation. But I'm smart enough now by hanging around with Ricky Cook, where he says, John, if you say, wow, you've got to stop and make a picture, John. And he doesn't let you off. And even if, he says, I don't care if it's good or bad. That's not the point. I want you to stop when you go, wow, and take a picture and train yourself to figure out what wow was. And the more you do that, the better your photography is going to become. So the next day we go back. And we're sort of on time and we're still not quite on time because we, we keep getting pulled over at different cool things on the way down to the prismatic spring. But as we're walking over that bridge, uh, for those who've been up there, you got to walk over that bridge and then go up the hill to the grand prismatic spring. This is what I see. Are you kidding? It's an image of a lifetime as far as I'm concerned. And so what did 150 other photographers do in the hour that I spent making images here? They walked right by me. They saw it. But what, what were they doing? They were going to Grand Prismatic Spring and nothing was going to get in their way. I, I can't tell you enough. You need to pay attention to when something says, wow, or you have a moment of perception. And here I was walking over that bridge and I went like that. That's all it took. I just went, and I went, oh, crap. <laughs> and I stopped. I said, you kidding me? A fisherman and the fumaroles going nuts. <laughs> I mean, I would have missed. I never made it to Grand Prismatic Spring two days in a row. Never. I don't care. I'm paying attention to wow. But folks, you got to show up. You got to show up physically, mentally, spiritually, all those things, right? And so we showed up at the last day of a workshop on Cape Cod. And I kid you not, the processing in this image was nothing. This is what the raw file looked like. Why? Because that's how insanely good the light was. And that's why your, your sensors are designed to capture perfect light. And the reason we have to fix them is because it's not great light or it's different than perfect. So, you know, we're photographing Mike Orby in his cool one of a kind Dory. And we're having a good time. And, and the workshop ends and, and we're kind of remembering this moment that I had with Mike and I was telling the people, I said, you need to stop photographing. Stop, 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 stop. And, I, and I'm yelling at them, just take in this moment. Guys, this is insane light right now. Like the best maybe I've ever seen. Just enjoy it. And then the workshop's over. I go back. I take a nap because I'm exhausted. And I wake up. And in my mind, I'm going, I should probably go make photographs over at Payne's Creek. And then, you know, the little guy on this shoulder is going, you're exhausted. Stay in bed. And I look quickly, look out the curtain. Yeah, it's kind of crappy out. I think I'll stay in bed. No, nah, I think I'll go. So it's 10 minutes away. I'll go. And I decided to go. And I showed up. This is what I was greeted with. I was like, not so bad. Sort of glad I got out of bed and came. And then I stayed a little longer just because I said, I'm here. I'm not particularly a sunset kind of guy, but what the heck? And so I looked down, you know, 180 degrees the other way down the beach and, and I went, oh, that's not bad. And look how nice of that guy to put the boat there just for me. That was very nice. There's a couple behind me drinking, they each have a glass of wine and they're giggling. And I'm like, what are they giggling about? And finally I said, what's what am I missing? They said, we just love that you talk to yourself when you make photographs, because <laughs> I do. And, and I said, but look, this is so amazing. I'm talking. And, you said, and they said, we live here. <laughs> we see it every night. I said, oh, got it. OK. But anyways, you know, so I'm, I'm having a party photographing this way. And I'm saying, gosh, I wonder what's going on back this way. So I turn around and I'm like, mind blown. What? Are you kidding me? I think I'm a sunset guy again. And then I say, after working on it that direction, I look back the other way and guess what? I've got the same identical, insane gold light that I had the morning. 
I've never had a day like that in my lifetime. Still haven't yet. It was insane. I mean, look at this. You got a Merlot sunset. You got this gold grass. The guy's boat out there. I mean, it was a party, right? You got to show up. Can't stay in bed. <laughs> you got to go. And when you go, you got to be open to those gifts that are just being offered to you all the time. The question is, are you awake? Are you present, grounded, and aware enough to be receiving those moments? You know, like this one. I'm photographing Dalen, the same guy, you know, Rocky guy. Same guy. We're having a good time. We're making pictures of Dalen. And then at the end, all of a sudden, his daughter's like bored to tears. And so we've got his daughter in a big old truck tire. Some of you may have heard this story. I keep being asked to add it back in. I had taken out of this, this particular presentation. But it's a, I think it's a worthy story. And if you remember the story, I'm sitting there and I'm paralyzed because I know there's something there, but my fears, uncertainties, and doubts about being a people photographer are so strong, I'm paralyzed because I don't know what to do. I don't know if I should include arms or can I cut the arms off? What f-stop do I? I'm not a people photographer. I don't know what to do. And then I gently say to myself, John, you're doing it again. You know, you're just, you're missing an opportunity because of your fears, uncertainties, and doubts. Just pick up the camera and take pictures. And so I do, and I make another one. And I make another one, right? And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm falling in love. And I make the triptych and I give it to Dalen and his wife with no memory, no recollection of what was done with Dalen that day. Because the, the memory and the lesson that I learned for my photography was that I am a people photographer. I just need to get out of the way. And I need to be open to those gifts that are being presented to me every day. See, a photograph is neither taken nor seized by force. Photographs offer themselves up all the time. Are you, are you going to be ready for that moment when it happens? How about rules? Here's what I say. Whose rules? Who made them? And why do you believe them? Seriously. Who made the rules? I don't know. <laughs> I don't have an answer. Maybe somebody else does. And why do we believe them? Like Cole, what a great example, right? You must not put something in the middle. You must not cut your frame in half. Why? Sometimes it works. Sometimes it's exactly what needs to. So look, I'm a believer in calling them guidelines. Replace this concept of a rule with maybe a guideline. Certainly, this guideline of having things in thirds and cutting your frame in thirds, it, it feels better. But not always. This idea of not putting something in the middle generally feels pretty static and it doesn't feel as good, right? But sometimes it does. Cutting frames in half. And, and what happens is... I used to judge, I don't do it anymore, because when I'm with other judges specifically, they respond based on rules. And to me, that doesn't work. If I'm looking at work, I respond based on how I feel. And then I might start thinking about composition and quality of light and wow factor and so forth. So I would, I would work with guidelines rather than say it, it has to meet a certain rule. And even though you talked about a competition, I wrote a couple of articles. And the only reason I wrote a couple is because the first one I wrote, I got just killed because I gave my strong opinions on, uh, on competition. And they didn't really understand because well, I thought I was clear enough, but I want to be clear here in this discussion, especially when I speak to clubs. I have no problem. My best friend, Dan, that I've spoke to you about that I did 40 tours with, is a PSA member and he reached the highest status you can in those competitions. Guess who is his biggest supporter? Me, because that was what brought him joy and happiness. I'm speaking here to those who might want to go to a different place in their photography other than winning accolades and awards. Again, winning accolades and awards is fine with me. I have zero issue with it. I'm just making an invitation that if you are working to get to, to make work that's your vision, 
I think it's harmful to me meeting somebody else's idea of what a good photograph is. I want you rather to be making images that come from here with guidance from somebody who says, I can help you make that meet your vision. Why does this happen that all of a sudden the, the cursor doesn't work? Let's try this. Okay. So I want you rather, and my invitation would be that you connect to the subject and the experience and let that be enough. And let those images reflect that connection and that experience. And work hard to make that come through in your photography. And then hopefully those who judge it, if you still want to do those competitions, will be blown away by that because they'll feel that just like I feel Stevie Ray Vaughan's vision slathered all over his strings. I want to feel that with your photography too, that that's what I'm looking at. I'm looking at the experience I had in New Zealand and those images are representative of those moments that took my breath away. I don't know if anyone will win an award and, and because I don't compete, it, it just doesn't get in my way. I'm making images that make my heart sing. That's it. So I'm inviting you to eliminate those fears and uncertainties and doubts. Or again, it's hard to eliminate them. I'm not saying that they don't happen, they do. But try your best to kind of meet those fears, uncertainties and doubts and push them aside like this. When, when uh, Johnson, my friend in Thailand said, uh, Taiwan said, you know, I want you to travel around the world with the 17 or $1,500 uh, ukulele I'm going to send you. I was like, I have no idea what to do. But I did my best. And I made some great images, 63 images that he uses. Somebody said, you should try infrared. And I'm like, I have no clue how to do infrared photography. It was a learning curve. And I was able to push through, the, through those fears, uncertainties, and doubts and get to where I felt comfortable doing infrared photography. See, I don't want you to let anybody tell you what you can and can't do. And this is another story that I tend to have in all my lectures because people ask for it. I'm at Zabriskie Point one time and I've been there many times and I'm going like this with my camera. I'm doing intentional camera movement. You know, there's a guy next to me, five foot two. If you remember those who've met me, I'm six foot six. So I'm tall, <laughs> he's short and he's looking up at me. You know, I knew he's, he's inquiring, what the heck is this guy doing? He finally summons up the courage and says, you know, what are you doing? And I look down at him and say, oh, I'm doing intentional camera movement. And he looks back up and he says, well, that's stupid. I'm like, I'm six, six, you're five, two. Seriously, you think that's stupid? Anyways, so, you know, three responses. I wanted to bop him over the head and make him five foot. Not a good idea. There's a park ranger up there. Probably wouldn't like me for doing that. You know, the second one is the human one. The human reaction is, yeah, you're right. Stupid. And we do that because especially when we think maybe we are stupid, right? We immediately let them, let, it lets us off the, yeah, dumb idea. I'm not going to do that anymore. Not me. I turned the camera around and said, but look, I'm making patchwork quilts. And guess what he did for the next 20 minutes? Made patchwork quilts with me. What shutter speed are you using? He says, I, you know, I, I look down while well, I'm using a fifth of a second. I, I'm kind of busy because you leave me alone. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. Look at mine. Look, look, look. <laughs> so, so he went from, you know, this, that's dumb. That's stupid to this is so cool. That's a big paradigm shift. So let's stop being concerned about what others are doing. I'm out of 12 people. I'm the only one at this lighthouse I showed you earlier. The only one. Everybody else went to where they're being called to or what was calling them. Said to Paul, what did you find? And he shows me this one. And I'm like, oh, are you kidding me? It's beautiful. But I wasn't there. I'm up at the lighthouse. So what I'm really, again, inviting you to do as we kind of start wrapping up here in the last 15 slides, um, I'm all about photographing what makes your heart sing. That, that's my tagline now. It's how I live my photographic life. That's what I want to do. And, and so again, a story that I'm asked to put back in is this guy. So for those of you who have heard this again, you know, I'll, 
I'll do it a little quickly, more quickly here. That's Maynard Ferguson. Maynard Ferguson was my idol in high school. I used to play along with his albums and um, drive my parents crazy because Maynard is an upper register screech trumpet player, a legendary um, Hall of Fame type of guy. And I adored him and I wanted to be Maynard Ferguson. And so I made this image in November of, of 2005 and I couldn't make a, it was a brand new 1D Mark II N digital camera. I'd been shooting film up until about two weeks before this moment when I got that camera. So I didn't know that ISO 800 back in those days was really bad, <laughs> I have no clue. But it's the only way I could make an image of Maynard that night. So the images sat until, uh, I don't know, I think it was July of the following year. And then finally, in, uh, in August, I made this image and I put it up on a, a photo website for sharing images. The next day, somebody uh, writes a post on photo.net because Instagram and Facebook, they weren't even around yet, and says, wow, that's really odd that you posted that image of Maynard last night because he passed away last night. It's just an awful experience that Maynard would pass away and how odd that he would pass away on the very night that I posted this image. Well, fast forward to getting a hold of Ed Sargent, who is the tour manager. I got a bunch of images to the, the Ferguson family because I thought they might like them. And then Ed calls me back three months later and says, you know, Maynard finished playing what will now be the last notes he ever played on an album. Uh, about two weeks, they wrapped up the album before he died. We'd love to use your image on the cover. And that all happened from photographing what makes my heart sing. I'm the only one there with a, with a tripod, I'm sorry, a monopod and a camera that night because I want to photograph my childhood hero, Maynard Ferguson. Now, I didn't do the artwork here. That was some graphic design person that they hired and took my beautiful image and ruined it. But anyways, whoop. Oh, shoot. I didn't mean for that to happen. Oh, I guess we got to listen to it again <laughs> because nothing I do gets rid of it. Sorry about that. Everybody knows that's MacArthur's Park, right? It's a great song. Okay. So photograph what makes your heart sing. So as, I, so as you master the technical aspects and then develop this vision that I'm talking about, I'm again inviting you to engage your heart. It's getting in touch with those emotions, those feelings that really allow your images to sing in my mind. So listen to your feelings and then use those feelings in your work. And again, a dramatic example that I tend to use, but it, and, it's, and it is dramatic. It doesn't apply necessarily to when you're photographing a tree or something, but you know, you go to Henryton, I believe this is, or down near you folks, right? In an abandoned place. And I photographed it like this because I was new to HDR back in whatever, 2006. And, you know, that's what I was doing. I was happy. I was playing. I had a good time. So those were the emotions. Those are the feelings I had was, ah, what a party. What a cool time I had with my friends going there. But then one of my friends sent me an article says, do you know what happened here? And I said, no. And I read that article and I was mortified because what happened there was pure evil. I mean, children who were there, who were basically outcasts were abused to the point of death and buried out back because they knew that nobody cared about them. Nobody was going to come see them. So we'll just abuse them physically, sexually, emotionally, and then we'll just discard them. And, and so when that was finally learned, they shut the place down. Well, guess what? In trying to make my point about using your feelings, I want to be clear, this image is accurate. But now it's not. My feelings changed. So I went back and reprocessed my images. Nobody will ever see a bright, happy image from that experience because my vision changed because of what? New knowledge. I read an article that made me angry. I have a connection to abuse from my past. And man, I had rage. And I'll never see it again the same way ever. So again, does that apply to a tree? Does it apply to a portrait? Yes, to be honest. <laughs> that viscerally, no. But let me give a quick example. When we engage with our heart and we use those emotions, this little gal I had photographed three years prior in Cuba. 
And I went looking to give a photograph to she and her mom. I couldn't find the house because it was a blue bars and a blue house. Well, look, they're white bars. And I, it just took me forever in the little town of Trinidad and Cuba to find. And there she was one day in the same identical pants, the same identical shirt, but she was just three years older because they don't have much down there for clothes and so forth. You talk about engaging your heart and having feelings. Oh my gosh. She ran out and threw her arms around me. And her mother came out. And when I gave her those pictures, she just was filled with so much joy and gratitude. So it does affect how we feel and the images that we capture. It's a very different expression from this little gal who had just run out to give me a huge hug. It's a very different experience. So I guess I'm inviting you to learn to dance. So what do you mean learn to dance, John? Well, there was a young doctor who was working in the Navajo Nation and he had a patient come in and the patient you know, had long hair. He's a Native American guy and very quiet. And he gets, you know, the young intern gets his clipboard and starts asking him questions about, you know, well, what's wrong with you? And the guy's not saying anything. The Navajo man is not saying anything. And, and finally, the young doctor's getting kind of frustrated. He's like, well, maybe he's a medicine man. Maybe, you know, maybe he, he just, he just, maybe I need to do a dance. He says, so, you know, the old man looked at him and well, the young doctor first says, you know, are you a medicine man? You know, do I need to do something? He says, and the old man finally speaks and he says, do you dance? And the doctor's like, do I dance? And, you know, it occurred to him that perhaps again at that point, it's a tribal medicine thing. And no, the doctor said, I, no, I don't dance. You know, do you dance? And, and he says, yes. Well, can you teach me to dance? And the old man says, well, I can, but you need to feel the music. So I can teach you photography. I can teach you all of the craft part of photography, but I can't teach you how to dance. I can teach you to dance, but you have to feel the music, right? You got to feel that connection. You've got to have that, that part of this thing in photography happening. So yes, I'd rather I can teach you to dance. I can teach you how to use a shutter speed. I can teach you how to do long moving water, all those things. But what I can't teach you is how to hear that music and move to that music and be in rhythm with me, all that stuff. So as I start every workshop I've ever taught, I invite you to bring your good time with you as you do this thing called photography that we're so blessed to do together. And we are, we see the world in a very different way. Have fun, my gosh, have fun. So what do we need to do? We need to master our craft, learn to be still, quiet and connect and be open to those moments of perception, right? Allowing images to speak to us, to call us, Pay attention to moments of perception or what turns our head. Ignore, or maybe throw away the rules or call them guidelines. Think about Freeman's comments that I shared tonight about learning to see more deeply. Eliminate or pay attention at least and be kind with these things called fears, uncertainties, and doubts. Engage your heart. Trust your vision. Trust the way you see the world and photograph what makes your heart sing. Thanks for bearing with me for whatever it was. It looks like 70 some odd minutes here. Uh, I hope you found something here tonight that might inspire you to, to think about the process of which you show up and photograph and, and that maybe will liberate you to, to go about the photographic journey that you're having in a slightly different way. Uh, again, making images that really make your heart sing. So I'm happy to stay around for as long as you'd like me to. I got to find my mouse here so that, I, oh, that's right, me. I always forget the important stuff. Most of you know who I am, but, but if you don't, you can find our website at barclayphoto.com and then John Barclay Photo on both uh, Instagram and Facebook. And I'm happy to respond to your emails. You can take a screenshot of that or 
with your phone or when, when I send out the thank you note that will include lecture notes and also the uh, free ebook, all that information will be in there as well. Okay, so I gotta do that first and then I gotta get this out of the way so I can see human beings. Hey, there we go. I can see you folks again. You can turn your cameras on. Well, I'll let Sandy tell you what you can and can't do. Yes. Yeah, so, um, well, first of all, John, that was just, um, uh, it really moves me what you say. And, and what moved me today was the idea of seeing more deeply to receive. It's receiving um, and open to the gifts that are presented to us. Yeah. So as a street photographer, I really sort of pictured myself walking and being open to receiving rather than chasing. Yeah. Well, well with street photography, though, Sandy, too, I mean, you got to kind of get in a position where the background might be what you want. But once you get all that in place, then you're just going to be. And the longer you be, the more you'll receive for sure. I, I love that idea. So anyway, thank you so much, John. We have lots of questions. I'm going to open it up to all of you to ask the question. And um, so we have a few in the chat room, but really, I think they were holding them for you. So ah, okay. go ahead, you guys. Who wants to ask the first question? I'll do, I, can I go? Sure, yes, Steve. Steve. Hi, Steve. Hey, um, hey, John, first of all, awesome, man. It's like Thank amazing because I, I love that philosophy. I, 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 it's, it's difficult sometimes, but I try to do the same thing. I remember going to uh, a Forest Haven with um, Arthur Ransom and a couple of people, and, and I'll go somewhere with like one lens, and I yep. took a fisheye, and that was wow. it. Wow. And uh, played with his fisheye. He said it'll never work. It, it <laughs> did. But oh, um, first of all, I, I think it's great. Your, your whole idea is that um, I remember a lecture we had years ago also. The guy was talking about um, thinking inside the box which is all of what the things you were talking about as far as um, things. And, and I just wanted to ask, have you ever seen this book? Yes, I have it. Yep, I've and read it. I think it's a great supplement to what you were talking about. And one of the things I like that they said is that um, every once in a while I put the camera down. Yes. And, um, but thank you so much. I mean, I'm just like, I'm, I got to go out and shoot right now. <laughs> Good. Yeah, I know. Good. I, I like that. Yeah. And you know what? I, on one trip, I went to San Miguel and I tried an experiment that I'll never do again because I got crucified. I said, OK, there's no way you're going to be able to photograph this wonderful town of San Miguel if all you do is run out with the camera. I mean, you're not going to get a play, flavor for the place. So here's what we're going to do. The first outing, no cameras. Oh, my gosh. And of course, what happens? You got a guy on a ladder against an orange wall and he's wearing a blue shirt. It's like perfect and nobody's got a camera. And they all looked at me and said, that will never happen again, Barclay, ever. <laughs> but there are times where I just sit and meditate with no camera. And it's hard. I'm not going to lie sometimes to do that. But I have learned, Steve, that especially if I'm, not, if I'm in a headspace of I've got crap going on at home, I've got COVID and I'm depressed because I... I can't run workshops for a year and I'm struggling to make payments. It's not going to work. I'm not going to be able to make good photographs. And so I'm willing to just go be with that sunset and not have a camera because I need that more than I need photography at that moment in time. And I, I think doing that, you think about things, you, then you begin to see things even more differently through the viewfinder. Absolutely. Once you see what it looks like without the viewfinder. Absolutely. Yep. Who else? John, this is Diana. Hi, Diana. <laughs> I threw a, a bunch of questions in there, oh. but since you mentioned COVID, one of the things I I wanted to talk about was, to, and and actually I echo what Sandy said. That was uh, just so inspirational. So thank you, and thank I you. hope you can come back again. We'd love to. Uh, next year, maybe. Um, yeah. But yeah, any advice for us to keep on, you know, um, connecting what makes our heart sing and. Um, you know, continually sharpening our personal vision during a pandemic, right? We can't leave yeah. the country. Yeah. Sometimes we can't leave our house, you know, except for maybe just interacting. And, and uh, you know, I'm almost like starting to get afraid to walk in a crowd now. Like I went to Rehoboth Beach yesterday and I 
you know, I'm extremely extroverted, but I stayed away from that part of the beach. There were very many people. But anyway, so and maybe this is going to change everybody's personal vision and whatnot. It'll be interesting to see how it changes photography. But do you have any words to say on that, on yeah, how to I, keep continue reconnecting? Yeah, I think, uh, and I've answered this one a lot, obviously, recently, because of the of very similar feelings that a lot of people are happy. And it's Diane or Diana. Diane. Diane, thank you. Um, what I did personally, and that's all I can really speak to and then pass that along, is I really did give myself permission to be depressed <laughs> for, for a moment of time, right? But then I knew, I knew that I had to do something creatively at some point. But I really did allow myself to grieve the loss of a business that for a year I, I had to go through that and that was what it was important. And once I finally cut you know, like six weeks, then I said, okay, I can do little things to start coming back. And those little things don't have to be getting a camera, but there's nothing that sort of replaces that experience of connecting and being out, even if it's in your own home. You know, I shared on, on a newsletter once, a friend of mine who sent me an extraordinary project that she did during COVID and she called it COVID something or other, I can't remember, but I, I had her send it to me and I put it up as a slideshow that people could then go look at. And what she did was perfect. She said, I am gonna finally photograph in my house a way that I've never photographed before. And what she did with that body, and it blew her away because she was just shocked that I thought it was that good, you know, which I think was also interesting that she, she was doing it to make her heart sing. She really got it. And she was just connecting with these little vignettes all over her house. And it turned into this extraordinary body of work that I just needed the world to see, which made her feel good, obviously, but it also made a whole lot of other people go, oh, I don't have to be going to Italy and New Zealand and you know, all these places, that's fun. I like doing it too, but I can go in a, a mile and a half and get to my local Peace Valley Park, or I can go to Naka Mixon. I can go to these local places and I can show up with a new attitude. I can bring my good time with me and I can be open to being taken. So you can experience all of the stuff I've talked about, Diane, in your local backyard, in your home. You don't, I've got another guy who made a project in his bathroom. And the shadows that he created from the different times of the day, the way those shadows moved in the bathroom were extraordinary. And we don't see that stuff because it's our everyday life. We just walk right by it. But when we start to employ some of these things that we've spoken about tonight, now all of a sudden we're seeing them and we've never seen them before because of the same things that Freeman's talked about. We're getting in the way. Our familiarity with our backyard is getting in the way. The the labeling that we've said, it's my backyard. There's nothing to photograph here. Mm -hmm. I've been on that road a hundred times. DeWitt Jones, the legendary DeWitt Jones, as he walks from his home in Molokai out to the mailbox is quite a long path to get out to that, right? It's probably a quarter of a mile. He had never made a photograph on that path. And so he gave himself a project one day. I'm going to photograph every day for 30 days. And he made extraordinary images on a path that he's never made a photograph on before. So I think those are some of the ways, Diane, that we can start to break out of those feelings of inadequacy, the FUD, all those things we talked about. It, it applies even right there in your home, your backyard, a mile and a half away. Yeah, de definitely. I know for me, I just, I've been, I've, I've been almost doing a body of work photographing Old Delicate City because I just go for a walk every day. So I just nice. take a walk there every day and so that do whatever makes your heart sing. Um, so I have another question wait, and then maybe I'll let other people. Diane, can, can, yep. wait a minute. Let's let somebody else and oh, then we can go come ahead. back to you. Okay, yeah, absolutely. Okay, um, Steve Sattler, I yes. know your question and it is so good. Do you want me to ask him your question or do you want to give it to him? Why don't you do it, Sandy? Okay, it's so good. I just, I, I couldn't wait to ask it. I wish I could uh, take credit for this, but I'm giving Steve. So um, the John says, Steve, 
Uh, you are one of the most creative people I've known over the years. Your creativity has evolved. In your opinion, what do you do to push the boundaries of your creativity? What do you do to keep it fresh? Yeah. Take it to new directions. What's your secret, he asks. So, yeah. thank you, Steve. How, how's this for, and this is just who I am. Steve knows this. I just, I'm honest. <laughs> That's a hard question. That's real honest. Because, and here's the other honest. I don't see myself as a creative person. Isn't that interesting? And so why? <laughs> because when I grew up, I'm the fourth child. I mean, I, I've been with a therapist for 12 years, right? I mean, in my life, I'm not about this, but because of you know, other things, right? And so because of language that I heard from teachers, because of being around others who are incredibly creative, I didn't see myself as creative. And then one day somebody finally said, but John, you play guitar, you write songs. Hello, you're creative. And I, and I didn't even tie those things together. In my weird way of seeing life, what was way more ingrained in me was John, you're not creative. You're not creative. You're not creative. I can't draw a stick figure. I can't paint. I can't draw a straight line. All those I can'ts that I told myself my whole life were far more impactful on me than anybody saying, yes, you are. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. So Steve, I go back to Nancy Rotenberg, who was my hero and my, my mentor who passed away. Well, just uh, let's see what's today. Today, I believe. 11 years ago today, she passed away. But she had the, the biggest impact on my life. And, and, and the words that I continually think of was from her was she was the one who literally grabbed me by my shirt and shook me lovingly and, and said, but you are. Yes, you are. You are. You are. You are. I mean, for many workshops, not just one, right? And so, you know, you got to stop thinking that way. So, Steve, I think what it all, it gets down to for me is something I've alluded to already, and I'll try to add a little more meat on the bone. And that is, I finally have allowed myself to honestly photograph what makes my heart sing rather than worrying about will Steve like it? Will Steve Dembo, who's, you know, these two are great photographers. And if I show this to Steve and Steve, that's where my head was before. They're going to laugh. They're going to go, what? Seriously? Why did you know? But that's how I <laughs> felt before. And, and Steve's saying, no, I, I hope you understand, Steve. I'm, I'm just trying to make a point. But that's where my headspace was before. And so that, to me, that's what restricts creativity in a big way is all those self-imposed doubts and fears and uncertainties about what you are. And so for me, the big leap in my photography, where I do think I became creative as Steve, and thank you for that compliment, was when I started letting go of all that. And I honestly, as, as DeWitt Jones would say, in the nicest possible way, I don't care what you think about my work anymore. And, and I hope that's, I want that to be really clear. It's not that I don't care. I love it when you say things like Steve, you just did. It makes, I'm human. My gosh, it feels good, right? And it feels good if I happen to show a picture and says, John, that's the best picture. I've, somebody did it the other day. That's the best take on that old grain of elevator, elevator stepped on I've ever seen. I'm human. That feels good. But that's not why I photograph anymore. It's just not. I photograph because... I must, it feeds my soul and that's just what I want to do. And if you like it, it's good. So, so that's part of the answer. And then because of that, Steve, I'm no longer worried about, Hey, you know what? I'm going to try putting two images together and I'm going to flip one. I wonder what's going to happen if I do that. Wonder what, what if I do that? What if I overexpose this? Ah, that's interesting. Look, I can put a texture. I never did that before on that scene. I'll do that. So I don't know if that was super helpful, but that's some of my thoughts on what keeps it fresh. But I think it's really important that the whole story to me is really important because what I understand by being with, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people teaching is they're really a lot like me. I find people are more like me than not like me. It's rare to find someone who is incredibly comfortable 
and thinks they're a great photographer. I, I'm trying to think of one. Off to, I bet even Ansel Adams wondered whether this was a good image once in a while. You know, I know Cole Thompson struggles. I know Chuck Kimberly does. I mean, I, I idolize, and Mitch DeBrown, I idolize these black and white photographers. They're my heroes. But I, again, I know Cole really well now. And he struggles just like you and I do. It's why he can't look at other people's images. Mm -hmm. It's not because he wants to be photo celibate. He has to be photo celibate. Because if he looks at other people's images, then he's just going to make those images. Because he doesn't feel confident enough in his own ability to get rid of those images that have just influenced him. He's just too afraid he's going to go do that. So he can't look at pictures, you know? Anyways. And I'm going to add to this that I see creativity in your coaching. You, you frame teaching as coaching. Well, I see your creativity there, how you get, you help us understand what your, your message is. Yeah, well, I, so, I appreciate that. I can see that. Yes. Yeah, I, I certainly think I'm, you know, I have a different approach. I mean, when you go yes. to workshop with me, I mean, if you need help in the technical, of course I have that, right? And I'm happy to do that. But I'm much more excited about the people who come on my workshops who want to try to find vision and have me help them get there. And now we're just having discussions about, well, you might consider this if that's what you're trying to do is create tension well maybe you want to get that little closer to the edge oh and then i don't tell them where i just say you know try, try moving it how about that what do you think how about that what do you think what, what you know i'm not saying i think this i'm saying what do you think is that getting you to where you want that's a lot more fun for me so that is a little different than somebody who's there's other workshop leaders who say okay no 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 don't go over there over here the shots here and i want to just shoot people <laughs> that's wrong thinking <laughs> if you're on a workshop you don't tell anybody where the shot is you let them find the shot <laughs> you know you might lovingly say because you do have people at different levels right the different walks in their journey so some people it's really hard to find something to photograph right so on those situations i am going to say to them well here's what i'm drawn to i love the rhythm and the shape of the mountains here, I love the foliage in front of it. So you might want to think about, you know, organizing something here. I'm not going to tell them with my camera and show it to them. You know what I mean? I want them to really believe that they can find something to photograph all on their own because everybody can. Okay, other questions? Who else has a question? Okay. Diane, it's now yours. You've got tons of questions. Good, let's go, Diane. No one else has questions? Well, come on, come gets, on. No, I don't. <laughs> They're too shy, Diane. It, you I and I extroverts, we have, have no problem. <laughs> Um, okay, so, um, so you know, one of the questions I have, it, it, it almost seems like um, what you're trying to encourage people to do is like a first nations vision quest to try and find our purpose in life. Right. Yeah. And so, and so I, like I think, yeah. And so I think, are there any suggestions or questions we can ask ourselves as we embark on this journey to discover our vision? Oh gosh, you're asking good questions. Hard questions. <laughs> Um, you know what I would encourage you to do, uh, Steve, help me on this, um, Sattler. Um, I think if you, yeah, I think this is right. If you Google how I found my vision, you will find Cole Thompson's essay on how that happened. Ah. Yeah. And so I think he'll answer that question way better than I can, because he's, it was a two year process that he went through to, to oh, realize yeah. what that was all about. And it's a great read. And I think that would be really helpful uh, because one of the things I'll just share with you is one, what he finally did is he made two piles of images. He went through and had all his prints and he made it piles of the images that he loved and the images that he was making to try to sell. You understand the difference? So here's the ones that, I love, I would hang on my wall. These are make, or my language, not his. These make my heart sing. All these others, yeah, they're okay, but they really were made just because I wanted to try to make people buy my work. 
very different piles. You know, so the one to make my heart sing ended up this big, the one, you know, of all the others was here. And part of the experience he talks about is at the end of that experience, he realized he was no longer ever going to do one of those again. That, that tall pile, I'm not doing that ever again. I'm only doing this pile over here. But that doesn't quite answer your question. You know, I think your question is more to how, Steve, I saw you unmuted. Do you want to chime in with something? No, 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 okay. you're doing, you're uh, doing good. That's okay. So, <laughs> thanks, Steve. So, so I think finding your vision though, <coughs> for me, it was very much like therapy, right? I mean, it, it, re it really is having the courage, and I think that's the right word, having the courage to once again be vulnerable enough to ask those introspective questions of what, are, what is my, what do I want my images to represent? Who am I? Thinking about who you are as a byproduct of all of those experiences in your life. Am I a caring, giving person? Am I a loving person? Do I see the world in a dark way? Do I see it as light? Do I see everybody as hopeful and positive? Who am I? You know, I mean, who am I as a person? And then how do I make, I love Stevie Ray Vaughan, man. How do I slather that all over my strings so that when Stevie plays with his face and it's, he's doing the guitar thing, you know, bending the strings, I'm feeling Stevie Ray Vaughan's soul. So how do I, as a photographer, do that? And I think the only way you do that is to genuinely have the courage to find out who the heck you are as a human being. And, and then put that all over there. And, and that's hard work, right? That, that is not easy work. I'm not <laughs> inviting you to do something that's easy at all. I'm inviting you to do something that's somewhat hard. But, and I also want to make it really clear too. It's, does it happen on every photograph I take? No, right? I mean, that, that'd be ridiculous, right? It, it becomes a way, I like what Ricky Cook says at the, the retreat. And here's a guy who's 25 years Nat Geo. You know, he's had to tell stories. He's had to have Bob Gilka, who was the editor at the time, and he tells us stories that, folks, it would make you cry. And I bet they cry at times, literally, because of the feedback they're getting for a pro project. I mean, they'll do stuff where they'll spend 50 hours, send in the project, and, and uh, Ricky would say, Gilka would say, seriously, this tells the story, Ricky? Do it again. Can you imagine being a Nat Geo photographer and your editor just said everything you did sucks? <laughs> you you got to be pretty strong as a human being at that point to overcome that and now go out and produce a story about Malaysia or whatever the heck you're doing, right? And, and so what I find interesting is here you get a guy who's been through that ringer. He's been through those questions. He's got journals this tall. And he brings them out when we do the retreats and he lets us read them. And they are storyboarding all of the projects he's done. He would go out without a camera on every assignment for a week to get to know the place, to know the people, to assimilate. Then he would get a camera, right? So he's, he understands how important that is. But guess what? At the retreat, and now whatever he is, 77 years old, when he's speaking and you're listening with rapt attention, because this guy has got has got knowledge beyond knowledge, his main discussion is, I'm more interested in what happens before I trip the shutter than anything else. I am more interested in what's going on with me before I trip the shutter. Wow. I'm, I'm sitting, I mean, I was like, holy crap. This guy is like one of the best. And he's still worried about that? And as, as Ricky would say, he shows up, am I showing up in neutral? And he's pretending he's using a gear shift in a car. And he's going, is that where I'm at? Or, I'm, or am I in drive? Or am I in first or second gear already? No, I want to arrive neutral, totally open. That's hard. It doesn't happen automatically, right? That takes practice. Thus, the reason we created the Contemplative Photography Retreat. You got me and DeWitt and Ricky talking about photography, but then you've got Flint Sparks, who is one of the most amazing humans I've ever had the pleasure to know, who is a 
psychotherapist for a living, but then is a, a Zen priest. And so he teaches meditation in a very accessible, easy way for us photographers, right? But he helps to drill home the importance of GAP, G-A-P, grounded, aware, present, GAP, grounded, aware, present. And, and that's how we need to show up as photographers, grounded, aware, and present. And the more we can do that, the more our images are going to resonate much more deeply. So it's like what Socrates said, right? To know thyself as the beginning of wisdom. There you go. Perfect. Perfect. Because that, you know, knowing thyself, and that's hard, right? I mean, it's, sometimes we don't want to know ourselves because that means we got to face the bad parts about ourselves too. And, and maybe <laughs> yeah. address that, right? Um, I've got plenty of those that I still work on. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you for giving us that insight, John. It's yeah. a pleasure. Samuel, you look like you have a question bubbling over. Come on. No, okay. Well, I'm just uh, <clears throat> very happy to have been uh, motivated, Good. inspired, I suppose. Excellent. To work hard at stopping worrying about all the responses I get to my photographs. And Thank you. To focus instead on what turns me on, what what makes what gives me that wow i think you said yeah and and go there that and makes if, me if so joe and happy. jane don't like it <laughs> tough bazookies two two quick stories i had a i had a uh, gentleman tell me that he used 500 picks as a sounding board and if he didn't reach a certain number he threw the images away can you imagine that threw them away never i mean gone never to be found again because somebody said it didn't rise up to a certain level on a score freeman patterson says the camera points both ways it's capturing the light coming in but it's also capturing your light don't throw anything away now obviously you know if you shot your foot because you accidentally tripped the shutter, well, throw it away. You know what I mean? And if you got fuzzy pictures, throw them away. But there's a there's real wisdom in Freeman's point. Camera points both ways. I mean, why would you why would you worry about somebody else and what they're saying, right? Yeah, it feels good when they like it, but man. And then the other story is I like to imagine Pablo Picasso back in the day. They're going to the bar. Yeah, they, hey. Hey, Guido, <laughs> Leonardo, hey, let's go, let's go get a beer. They go get a beer and, and, and Pablo's got himself a canvas and he's got it all covered with craft paper. Of course, they didn't have it back then, but I'm imagining he's got craft paper. He's got it wrapped, tied up and everything. He has it sitting next to the stool at the bar. And finally, Leonardo says, what do you got? something new and he goes oh yeah got something new and he he opens it up and proudly shows him an abstract painting <laughs> and leonardo goes what on earth is that crap seriously what really like nothing sharp <clears throat> were you drunk what what is this crap and all the other guys at the bar they're they're like ah, really this is a joke right and it turns into, you know, a form of art. So did he worry about what Leonardo and Guido, you know, they all said, no. He said, now nah, you, his answer was, I imagine you guys just don't understand. You don't get it. You're not connecting with your subject. <laughs> you're not, you're not, you know, you just don't get it. It's going to be big. <laughs> so there you go, Samuel. Good job. If that's all I did tonight was get you to stop worrying, I'm happy. <laughs> well, I'm going to work at it. I'm not Good. promising you to work stop. At it. And <laughs> Sandy is going to help you. <laughs> uh, yeah. oh, Ola, Ola, come on. You've got a question, Ola, or Guy. Hmm. Oh. I, have a, I have a music question. Oh, good. Good. Yeah. <laughs> so who would you say is the Stevie Ray Vaughan of the ukulele? Of the Uka, oh, Jake Shukamaboro, easy. Yeah, okay. Do you know who Jake is? Um, gonna, Google does, and that's where I was headed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I, let me see. How do I sell Shukamaboro? I'll, I'll, <clears throat> I can send that in the notes. But Jake, 
is absolutely hands down the best ukulele player on the planet. And that's by anybody's uh, definition. And he's got recent albums out that he's playing with trios. He does things with an ukulele that you don't even understand it's a ukulele. I mean, it's, it's like a rock and roll instrument when he's playing it in certain times, but he's also playing traditional Hawaiian music too. But he's extraordinary. Jake Shukamaboro. Is he the guy in the documentary Life on Four Strings or something like that? I, it might be. That that would logically oh, be him. I think, then, then, then I do know who that is. Yeah, from, from Hawaii. Super nice guy. And and if you're if you're an Apple Music guy like me, it's free to go find out what his stuff sounds like. Ola, anything? No, it's okay if you don't. I'm you know I'm not trying to make you feel <laughs> on the spot. I thought I, mean, was, I thought it was wonderful, and I absolutely related to what you said. Um, thank you. Um, you're welcome. Yeah. I'm actually going to push Ola a little. So she she was a person I was thinking of. You don't need to leave your backyard to take absolutely phenomenal images. She she takes advantage of the pictures that are brought to her. Oh. So can you want to tell him a little about the being an entomologist almost of the oh. photography world? Oh, interesting. Oh, but I'm into nature photography. I like um, insects uh, because there's um, um, such a large number of them. So, smaller and smaller admittedly sadly yes. uh, but i work from home so i take breaks and um i walk around with my camera and every time i go out at different times i run into something um amazing wow so actually all my pictures start with oh my gosh excellent but they are not, phenomenal they are not art photos that they are just that what turns me on Amen. And I will add that they tell a story. And sometimes you put words to your images. I love it. So, hang on. Oh, I hear something. I know, I'm muted. Sorry for calling you out there, Ola, but it's great. <laughs> Thank you. Excellent. I love it. Please share some with me at the email address. I'd love to see some. Or send me a website or something where I can see them. Thank you. Okay. What what okay. she does with leaves is incredible. Yes. Really? That's, yeah. Oh. Dried leaves. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Okay. Hey, here it, here's an idea for you then, Ola. So one of my dear friends, Bill Strom, who is my first assistant on workshops, he passed away in 2009 of uh, cancer as well. Uh, a, he was a brilliant macro photographer, not necessarily insects, but macro in general. And that's what he saw. And so as he was what turned out to be in the last two months of his life, I had him come out to my house at the time. And I said, let's just go photographing. I was trying to help him feel better and be a good friend. And I said, just bring your camera. And he said, ah, I'm just not feeling good enough to photograph. I said, ah, bring your camera. And he was, and sure enough, he got a burst of energy and we went locally. It was fall, it was October. And, and all of a sudden I'm watching his process and here's what he's doing. He's finding leaves and he's breaking them. And then he's finding color to put behind them. And I'm like, fascinated. And so he's breaking these crunchy leaves, <clears throat> finding these patterns that he's making by breaking them gently, putting a red leaf behind it, a yellow leaf, an orange leaf behind it. And now he's just photographing that pattern that was created by breaking with color behind it. <clears throat> and then, you know, so that experience is going on. And I'm now sharing this with Jim, uh, a friend of ours, Jim, who's a retired doctor and has uh, muscular dystrophy and Jim Ritchie's just a cool guy. And Jim, and now what you got to know is Bill, very stoic, harsh, New Yorker, doesn't show his feelings ever, right? Jim says to him, he says, you do realize that your leaf pictures are self-portraits, right? And Bill started sobbing, sobbing, because Jim was exactly right. They were self-portraits of Bill's broken body, which that's what he was creating, was a broken body with that life left behind it. Goosebumps as I'm telling that story. 
How powerful is that? You know, you talk about unconsciously putting your story into your imagery and bringing you to that act of photography. Bill was doing it and didn't even know he was doing it. But as soon as somebody pointed it out, it brought him to sobbing tears. Yes, they are self-portraits of my broken, failing body. Pretty cool. Okay. So we're losing people like crazy. They must yeah, be yeah, they are. They are dropping. But I do want to say in the um, chats that people are leaving by saying good night. Oh, Wonderful. yeah. I'm, Thank you so much. I'm not offended yeah. at all. It's a long night. No, nope, it's yeah. fine. Oh, my goodness. I'll just cry a little bit later. <laughs> hey, John, are you, John are, you, are, you, are you planning, you're planning any um, workshops? Everything right now is full. Uh, so we had to cancel Yellowknife in Canada because even though they're opening up, the Northwest Territories are not. They have, they have a tribe up there that they're trying to protect. Uh, so we had to cancel that in September, but we are still doing Acadia. They're both full and that's in October. Uh, I just literally filled the last spot for the contemplative retreat in February. I just filled the last yeah. spot for our hideout workshop in, in Wyoming. And that's in February. Death Valley with Cole Thompson is full. We do have wait lists though, you know, and with COVID, we're finding some people are feeling reluctant potentially to travel. So if you do have an interest for anything, you know, I'll, I'll, things are opening more than they would in the past. So depending on your comfort level with traveling, whether it's a location you can drive to, you know, all five that we've done this year, we've been very successful. We no longer require that people share a ride, but they can if they want to, but we don't require it anymore. We don't, we do set up dinners, but we don't, we just say, look, your comfort level to come if you want to, or if nobody shows up, don't. Sometimes we'll get a big conference room and we'll sit in all different parts of the conference room just mm -hmm. so everybody feels comfortable. You know, wear masks when we're out in the field. If somebody, if that's what we want, that's what we do, just to be kind human beings to each other, even if you don't like masks. We still ask you to just be a nice human for that moment in time and and do the right thing to, to make your fellow photographer feel comfortable. It's, I think that's a nice way to be. So that's going on and we are, and the Palouse, the only thing I'm getting ready to do is I'm waiting to hear back from uh, the hotel and the Palouse that I use. I'll be doing a mid June Palouse workshop. And so I've got nobody signed up for that yet, but just be aware that if you have interest to do anything with me, the best thing you can do is send me an email and say, Hey, John, you mentioned the Palouse. Can you put me on the list to be notified first? And that's what will happen with me. So if I've got 20 people who have said at some point, you know, this last year, hey, if you go to the Palouse again in 2022, can you let me know? There's no obligation with that. It just means that those 20 people are going to have the first shot at those 10 spots. That's all that means. Cool. Thanks. You're welcome. And I am... I am working on a book, you know, the, the, the title was going to be Dream, Believe, Create after my first lecture, but I think it, I'm thinking it might change to photograph what makes your heart sing, but, uh, <laughs> but that's, that's in the works, but man, I, you talk about FUD folks, writing for me, I had to take remedial English in college, so imagine that FUD. So I have to get through that mental block, but I'm doing it. I, I, I'm taking, I can hear Nancy Rotenberg in my head saying, John, yes, you can. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. <laughs> and you can find other people who are much better at grammar than I am, and they can fix it and tidy all that stuff up. And so now that I understand all that, I just need to get the thoughts down and then mm -hmm. hopefully uh, self-publish a Kickstarter book. So hopefully in the next year or so, that'll come to fruition. So stay tuned if you're on my mailing list from my, if you want to get on a mailing list, I stink at getting a monthly newsletter out. So you might get a bi-monthly newsletter or a tri-monthly newsletter from me. But, uh, uh, but nonetheless, if you go to the homepage there, you can sign up for the newsletter and at least be getting those types of notifications uh, and follow me that way as well. Thanks. Folks, thank you so much. I've enjoyed the conversation. I appreciate the feedback very much. Sandy, you've been delightful to deal with. I wish everybody was as kind and generous and thoughtful 
and engaging as you are to work with. I mean, they're all pretty good, but you're uniquely special. Mm. Jim, she deserves a raise. <laughs> <laughs> double your salary, Sandy. Yeah, right. yeah we're gonna double your salary. Plus zero equals zero. <laughs> yeah, I, I know, but I just need you to know, I, when I was in the medical sales world that I was in for 35 years, I would let receptionists know when they were exceptional, I would tell them so because to me, the receptionist was the face of the company that I was making sales calls on. And when that receptionist was exceptionally good, they were doing their company a huge service. And so you doing the job that you do, Sandy, is a huge service to your club in that you're getting people who are coming excited to come speak to your, your, uh, your club because of how good you are. So thank you for that. We know. Oh my God, that, oh my God, that just means so much to me. You know, we do so much now during COVID on Zoom. I'm alone. I do this alone, you know, so. Yeah. Hey, one last thing on that for both Jim and Sandy and anybody else. My friend, David Kingham, who's a wonderful uh, we, workshop. You've had him? Yes. Good. So you're aware of his uh, camera club hub. I am on that. And Good. yes, I, yeah, I've seen you and I we're on there as well. Good. Yeah. I want to make, yeah, I want to make yeah, sure. Thank you. If, if you don't mind, if uh, whomever uh, wants to go out and write a review for any of the lectures you've seen, that's very helpful for others who are looking to get speakers. At least they'll have firsthand knowledge from somebody who's seen it. And you might be able to help them understand how you felt about anything I might've presented. That'd be very helpful on that. Yeah, um, and what I will do is send out a link to the camera, the camera club hub. hub to a camera club. Yeah. Um, so if anybody wants to do that, yes. yes. We've had several speakers and- um, It's a great place to find them. Yes, Lots it's of good a great people. service. Have you had Cole Thompson too? Yes. Good. Yes. And I'm sure- Well, John and, John sure and Sandy, I finally found it, but me. Mark Cowbell to you guys. <laughs> thank you so much that was just great yes okay Cowbell, my friend oh that's Bye. great okay oh, folks yeah. good night everybody thank good you night. for joining us see you, john. Thank you. Good night. john bye steve Amazing. so good to see you again buddy yeah good to see you be well okay. Okay. steve dembo good to see you as well and norma oh, there you are. Good. same to you love you sweetie Aww. Bye-bye. Good night, everybody. I'm going to end the meeting.